Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are, whenever you may be listening. This is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two, episode number nine. And I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge, and I am so happy to be with you. I'm very excited for you all to hear this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks. I'm happy when you listen to any episode of Talking Audiobooks and would encourage you to listen to them all, but I think this one is something that you're really going to enjoy, and it's not because of me. I hope you enjoyed last week's interview with Jess the Audiobook Worm from theaudiobookworm.com and Audiobookworm Promotions. We had so much fun interviewing Jess last week that we thought having guests on is really awesome. Let's do it again. And this week we doubled our pleasure and doubled our fun. We have two guests with us this week. We have author B.L. Berry and narrator Andrea Ems, and they're going to talk about their collaboration on B.L. Berry's Love Nouveau the Art of Falling, book one, which just came out as an audiobook in the month of June. Uh, the book is a few years older than that, as you'll hear in our conversation. And I have to say that this conversation, it has already been recorded as I am doing this introduction. So I can tell you that this is a lot of fun. And um, I talk with each of them a little bit about their careers and about specific things relating to their careers. And I then talk to them specifically about the book and aspects of the book. You're going to hear an excerpt of Love Nouveau during the interview. I mentioned when recording it that I have read it. I listened to it the day before uh, I recorded the interview, and I really enjoyed it, as you'll find out in the interview uh, it's really fun. They're both very willing and eager to talk, and that's always a great thing to get out of a guest when they're happy to go on, and then I don't have to talk as much, and that works out well for you because you don't have to hear my voice, and you hear my voice so much every week anyway that, you know, it's nice to hear someone else, and especially if that someone else is not producer Ken. But uh, this interview is really fun, I think, and you're going to really get a kick out of it. Before we get to the interview, though, we have some business to take care of, and that business is by way of our contest. Uh, we have a July contest going on where one lucky winner is going to receive four promo codes from audible.com to use on whatever titles you want. Now, if you have been listening carefully the past few weeks to the show, or if you saw some of my social media plugs, you know that you could enter the contest by going to facebook.com slash talking audiobooks and liking our Facebook page, and you would gain entry into the contest simply by doing that. And that is still true. You can go to facebook.com slash talking audiobooks, hit the like button, like our page, and you are entered into the contest. However, producer Ken decided that he wanted to try an experiment. And so because he had plenty of time to try this out, he set up a text message number so that you can also text this number and you will be entered into the contest as well. The number is 313131. That's 313131. That's what you have to text. Now, this is the important part. The text message you send needs to say EZ Enter, and that's all one word E. Z, the letter Z, E, 
E-N-T-E-R, easy enter. And you will get a notification back letting you know that you are entered into the July contest. I must remind you, however, that these uh, codes are valid on the U.S. version of Audible. So you're going to need a U.S. account. We should look into doing something for you UK listeners and uh, those of you maybe in Germany or wherever else you might be. But right now, these are uh, U.S. codes that we are giving out. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trobry. And we're back, and as promised, we have with us a couple of special guests on the Talking Audiobooks podcast this week. We have author B.L. Berry, who is the author of the book that we're going to discuss today. It is called Love Nouveau. It is uh, The Art of Falling, book one. B.L., welcome to the show. Thank you. And of course, this is an audiobook podcast, so we can't very well just talk about the book without bringing on the narrator of Love Nouveau. That is the wonderful Andrea Ems. Andrea, thank you for joining us as well. Great to be here. I've been looking forward to this one for a little while. For the sake of our listeners, we're recording this on July 13th, and I happened to listen to the book yesterday and really enjoyed it. So we're going to get into how all of that came together in just a moment and walk you sort of story through finally getting the audiobook out. BL, I wanted to start with you and have you sort of introduce yourself to the listeners and talk a little bit about yourself and how you got into writing before we actually get into the book proper. Well, as you mentioned, I am BL Berry. I am from the Kansas City area. And Love Nouveau was actually my debut book um, back in 2014. And since then, I have three published books, two anthologies, And my fourth full-length novel, Birthquake, is going to be releasing this September. So I'm very excited about that. But how I got to writing, I mean, I've always been a writer in some capacity, even when I was, you know, very, very little. And my mom always used to joke that, you know, I, I grew up telling lies. And then I started to write them down. And they turned into these magical stories. And I guess it was about 10 years or so ago, I kept kind of thinking I wanted to write a full-length novel, not really sure what I was doing or how to go about doing it. And I started and stopped, you know, 30 dozen times easily. And my husband, one day, he just said, you know, just write the darn thing, sit down and just see what happens. And, and so I did. And Love Nouveau was the product of my very first, you know, attempt, serious attempt at a full-length novel. And It seems to be pretty well loved by its readers, so that makes me very happy to know that my words can touch people in ways that I never even imagined possible. Well, that's interesting that that is your first one. I have to say I didn't know that it was your first when I listened to it, but it was very enjoyable. And you mentioned that it came out in 2014, and a couple things jumped out at me in regards to that, one of which is that um, the... It doesn't affect the story in any real significant way, but there are several mentions of the futility of the Chicago Cubs in the novel, and then they went and ruined it by winning the World Series last year. I know. When it happened, I was like, because I'm a huge Cubs fan. My husband is too. We always joke that, you know, any team can have a bad century, which is a direct quote from the book, actually. And when they won, we were so elated and just over the moon. And then the back of my mind, I'm like, do, do I need to rewrite and republish this? Like, what do I do? And so I was like, you know what? We're just going to leave it as is because it's kind of fun and kitschy in its own way in that respect. But it's fun to look back and think of how times have changed so quickly in such a very short period of time. And there was something else I really appreciated in the book. It was a single line, but it caught my attention because of my own predilection for uh, this particular time period. 
Um, there's a line in there, I believe, where uh, the main character, Ivy, says, I'm the Daria to her Quinn. <laughs> yes, I, I am a huge Daria fan from the 90s. Um, I would love nothing more for that show to come back. I, I really appreciated that show and its time. And I love when people catch on to that because it's little nuances from, you know, me growing up. And that, that was from my formative years. Um, and people, you know, they reach out and they're like, that's hilarious. I totally get it and blah, blah, blah. And it, it touches a sweet spot when people pick up on those little guys. So thank you. Well, there's a audiobook connection to Daria because uh, one of the male voice actors in Daria is a man named Mark Thompson. And he narrates, narrates a lot of the Star Wars audiobooks that are produced by Penguin Random House. He was the voice of Kevin... And I believe a couple of the teachers on Daria. And uh, I first heard him narrate a Star Wars book, and then I realized he was on Daria, and I had a little bit of a moment. So uh, <laughs> I'm a very big Daria fan. So I really did uh, enjoy that little throwaway, but I, I enjoyed the whole uh, thing, which is saying something because this is a romance, and that's not really a genre that I – read a lot of. In fact, I posted on Facebook. I said, here's something I never thought I'd say. I'm listening to a romance novel tomorrow in preparation for an interview. <laughs> but I really did enjoy uh, the story, especially when it got going. There's some fun twists and turns and uh, something happens and I won't spoil it, of course, but there's a, a pivotal bombshell about two thirds of the way through the book. And it's one of those things that if I had really thought about it, I probably could have seen it coming, but not really thinking about it, I was caught completely off guard. So let's talk a little bit about the story itself. What's the genesis of it and how did it all kind of come together? Well, for me, when I write a story, I, I'm very unconventional. A lot of authors can sit down and kind of map out exactly where they want to go and I, I'm more of the fly by the seat of your pantser. So I probably percolated on the general plot for about six weeks while commuting to and from work down in Kansas City before I ever typed the very first word out on the page. And I kind of go where, where the scene and the characters take me. So I never write in chronological order, which a lot of people, they're, they're like, how can you do that? And somehow in the end, the dots always seem to connect. Um, but in this particular case, I actually wrote, you know, one of the crux scenes first. I had a very clear vision of what Ivy was feeling, what was going on around her. And I think there's a reference to, you know, there's all this chaos happening and here she is, the silence, the quiet, the eye of the storm. And so that was sort of the very first words that were born out of that entire scene, or excuse me, out of the entire novel. Um, and from there... I tend to write, you know, that crux moment. And then I write the ending because I like to ground myself to know where I want the characters to go, where I want them to end up. And then everything kind of falls out in reverse. So it does require a lot of scrapping of words and rewriting scenes 20 times to make it all fit together in the end. And a lot of folks might see that as counterproductive. But for me, that's really how I think the best plot progression comes through. It's interesting that you mention that you sort of wrote it in reverse in many respects because listening to it I feel like even in spite of that you actually end up with a pretty linear story that goes from point A to B to C to D and so on and so forth. So you have these two main characters and why don't you tell us a little bit about I Ivy I almost called her Ivory for some reason and I've been Trying to avoid that all day, am imagining these questions. But Ivy and Phoenix yeah. are your two main characters. And what would you tell the listeners of the show about these two people and how they come together? Yeah, so Ivy is – she's just graduated from, co um, from college. She went to the University of Wisconsin. And she's definitely the black sheep of the family. Um, never sees eye to eye with her parents – um, she's got a sister that she just doesn't get along with. And so she's kind of excommunicated herself 
in some ways. And then her parents have kind of just been like writing her off in other ways as well. So the dynamic there is not good. And she lives in downtown Chicago. So a lot of the like the physical point of references are all places that I've been to, that I've visited, that I've loved. Um, on my way home from work when I lived there, I would walk by this one house every day up in um in the Gold Coast area. And that was, you know, down to a T what I've always envisioned their their estate to be, for lack of a better word. Um so Ivy is this black sheep. She's kind of, you know, on the searching, searching for herself and who she really is and what she wants to do with her life. And she's got a very big passion for art. And that was really fun for me because I got to incorporate a lot of my art history emphasis from my undergrad days into the work as well. So there's a lot of different references throughout the piece. Phoenix, on the other hand, he <laughs> Everybody that reads Phoenix seems to fall in love with him on some capacity. He is sort of not the stereotypical book boyfriend, but just he's the good guy that you root for. Um, he's got a past. He's got his own, you know, gremlins, but he doesn't let that stop him from getting to know Ivy. And he's from St. Louis and she's from Chicago and they meet at this party up in Madison um, right after graduation. And so one of the fun things for me to write about was this idea of a long distance relationship and falling for somebody you can't see all the time and just really getting to know a person on a level just by talking to them. And again, you only know what the other person tells you. And I think there's a line in there about, you know, when you meet somebody, you can be anybody who, you know, that you want to be. So you can make up lies or you can turn around and be radically honest. And for the first time, Ivy was really, truly radically honest in this moment. Um, so the two meet, and they go on exactly one date before parting their separate ways. And from the instant that they meet, you know, she is just smitten and she doesn't know what to do with herself because of it. Ivy is very honest, but it's sometimes it's to her own uh, detriment. There are times in the book where she lets the paranoia of her past experiences sort of get the better of her. That she does. And I think that's true to form for any relationship, too you know, be it long distance or close proximity, you're always going to have those little what ifs in the back of your mind, you know, based on what's happened to you in your past. And, you know, we, it's very clear early on that she's been burned by a previous boyfriend and, you know, just the way things fell out has impact or has impacted, you know, how she approaches everything with Phoenix. And you also brought up her family dynamic. And the part of that that interests me the most is actually her, relationship with her father because while it's strained I feel like that's the most salvageable family relationship she has yeah and you're right to make that assessment um there's things that you learn about her and her father that come out in the sequel love abstract they're, they're a very interesting dynamic and I think he's a little bit more like Ivy than she wants to admit but between you know the mom and Genevieve who's her sister yeah, the dad is definitely the best person that she can relate to within her family unit. Yeah, I sort of in my head, I came to the conclusion that he was once a a bit of a romantic like Phoenix, but then he got trampled underfoot by her mom. That is a very, very accurate thing to say. So the book came out in 2014, but the audiobook uh, didn't come out until last month. When did you decide that uh, you wanted to do an audiobook version of your novel? Well, it's, it's again, I never seem to do anything in order. <laughs> so um, earlier, I guess it was last year, I had released um, An Unforgivable Love Story narrated by Megan Kelly. Kelly. I Thank believe. you. Uh, but she did a fantastic job with that. And that was my first foray into the audiobook world. And after, you know, my readers got their hands on that, they all started asking, so what's going on with Love Nouveau? When am I going to get to hear Ivy's voice? You know, what's going on? Give me updates. And I was like, well, gee, I, I never thought about, you know, pursuing an audiobook one with this. So this was really driven by the readers and their love for this story and the love of these characters, which, you know, as the proud mama bear of this book, it just made me beam and glow inside because I love that I've got a set of ferocious readers that love Ivy and Phoenix just as much as I do. It, w it was really their asking that made me pull the trigger to post it for, um, for auditions. Okay, so let's talk about that. Once you got this reader demand, what were some of the uh, first steps you took uh, on the journey to actually getting it published as an audiobook? 
I worked through ACX with the royalty share, and I'm not sure if your readers are familiar with how royalty share works. Um, but with this piece, I had a very clear vision for what Ivy needed to sound like and the persona and just the energy and tone in her voice. And I basically, I posted a short audition clip. Um, I don't remember what it was. Andrea may remember. We got a ton of auditions rolling in. None of them hit the mark. At one point, there was there was a, um, a talent that I really liked, but between scheduling and personalities, things just weren't going to work out. And so for a while, I just, I left it up there and there wasn't a lot more, you know, bites to the audition process just because, you know, once it falls past the first couple of pages, it kind of goes into the abyss at ACX. And out of the blue one day, I, I get this email from this delightful young lady named Andrea. And she was asking if I'd picked up any talent for it. And we talked a little bit and she'd be like, you know, I, I'd be interested in submitting an audition. And she did. And no joke. I think it might have been 10 to 15 seconds in. I called my very best friend and one of my uh, fellow authors, Stephanie Rose. I'm like, I just heard Ivy's voice. Do you want to hear it? And she's like, what are you talking about? And so I sent her the audition. She's like, holy crap, get this girl book. Like, she was fantastic. She she slayed it. And it, it's been no looking back ever since. And what we're going to do right now before we bring Andrea into the conversation and let her take over for a little bit is we're going to play a little bit of an excerpt so you can hear what BL heard in at least voice quality. It might not be the same sample, but you can definitely hear what she heard in, in the uh, quality of Andrea's work. So right now we're going to take just a brief pause for an excerpt for Love Nouveau, The Art of Falling, book one. I turn to look at him, and he's already staring. The feeling that takes over is indescribable. Suppressing a flirtatious smile, he simply says, Let's dance. Put on your red shoes and dance the blues, I sing back, quoting my all-time favorite David Bowie song. His face lights up with childlike delight as he takes my hand and places it over my heart. Did you really just say that? I think I may have just fallen in love, he muses with a twinkle in his eye. I grew up listening to Bowie. It's as if the powers that be have plucked this guy out from the sky and put him in my presence. Anxiously, I let him lead me out under the night sky. Oak trees in the backyard are strung with Christmas lights, like twinkling stars winking fatefully down upon us. In my intoxicated haze, they cast an ethereal glow. Phoenix and I move in sync with the bass line of some ridiculous 90s R&B song, our hands exploring each other's bodies. He smells sexy, like damp earth and musk, and it's easily the manliest scent I've encountered. The contours of his arms are magnetizing. I couldn't pry my fingers away if I tried. Beads of sweat snake their way from my hairline, between my shoulders, and pool in the small of my back. It's difficult to tell if the salt I taste is from the alcohol or my skin melting into itself. I grip my hands around his neck and gently twist his hair between my fingertips. Phoenix rests his forehead against mine, eyes cutting right through to my soul, and I hear a soft groan escape the back of his throat. I trace my tongue over my lips in anticipation and take slow, deep breaths, committing myself not to screw this up. More than anything... I want to know what he tastes like. Everything about his presence feels right. We fit together like two pieces of a puzzle. We read each other's bodies like we've done this before. Phoenix licks his lips and I can taste a sweet blend of alcohol and sweat in the space between us. Heat rises from deep within me and I close my eyes, willing him to make a move. Kiss me already, damn it. We get lost like this for a few songs, me, a siren, working to bring him into my possession. I sense him leisurely eyeing my body, inhaling my hair, soaking me in as much as he can. And when his soft lips delicately press against my temple, relief washes through me. He wants this too. Our gravitational pull is undeniable. Phoenix traces his tongue teasingly to my jawline before nibbling on my earlobe. I can't help but moan as the sensation resonates deep inside my body. My pulse quickens, and I'm breathless. I need his kiss to fill my lungs with air. 
I need his touch to make me believe that good guys like him do exist. I need him to... I need him to get out of here. My head snaps back involuntarily and my eyes shoot up in surprise. I'm drunk. So very, very drunk. And I'm overwhelmingly desperate to get away from this party. The earth shifts on its axis and my sense of security goes askew. I scan my eyes through the crowd, desperately searching for Rachel, Cassie, any familiar face. I have to get out of here. Go home. Sleep the alcohol off. Now. Ivy? I hear him call out to me, but his voice is muffled. I am underwater. Phoenix's nails dig into the flesh of my arms. My head fills with stars. My legs are lead, but I find myself floating weightlessly, dancing in slow motion. Try as I might, words fail me. I attempt to respond to him, but each thought is trapped inside my mouth, clinging to the back of my teeth like an insect struggling to free itself from tar. My body shakes in Phoenix's arms. Darkness begins in the corners of my eyes and seeps through, taking over my line of sight. A blank page bleeding ink. The crisp music turns murky. My brain slurs. My knees buckle. Give out heaviness. Darkness. And we're back, and uh, Andrea is now with us. You just heard a sample of her work, and Andrea, uh, before we get into your specific narration of the book and your thoughts on it, uh, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into narrating audiobooks in the first place? Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Andrea Ems, and I've been a professional actor for about 20 years, and a lot of that's been in voiceover. Um, commercials, um, animation, video games and stuff. But three years ago, well, in 2014, I discovered audiobooks because my husband, who has dyslexia and is an avid reader but has trouble, um, listens to audiobooks all the time. And he's like, Having, why don't you get into audiobooks? I'm like, hmm, why don't I? So I looked it up and uh, figured out, like, you know, do you need an agent? What is the, because I had been out of voiceover for a long time. Uh, what do I need to do to get into it? And I got into uh, the ACX, which is the audiobook exchange uh, forum where I met BL and started learning all about the audiobook industry and what it takes because it, it's a completely different vocal technique or acting technique than what I'm used to. So I did coaching and this and that. And I'm a book nerd. So I love books. I read, I know right now I read books for a living, but I also read them for pleasure. So I'm constantly reading like five books at a time. Yeah, so it's just been really fun uh, to get into something I love so much and get paid for it. <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty amazing. So when you first got into it, did you seek out anybody for advice? And what kind of advice did you get from uh, audiobook narrators that you came across? Actually, that's a fantastic question. You know, when I was doing research, I always look for coaches or are there any classes I can take to really understand the craft of audiobook narration, which is an art and a science. It's not just the art of um, the acting behind reading a book, but there's also a lot of technical aspects because I'm in my booth, but I also have my recording software. I've got to understand how that works and, and I have to learn how to edit and master and do all of this tech work that if I were to go into a commercial VO spot, I wouldn't have to. I would just go behind the mic. So I actually saw an article as I was reading about ACX and found my first coach, Sean Allen Pratt, who is incredible. And I always send people to him. And from there, I learned a lot of the foundations uh, in nonfiction, which also translates to fiction and then just kept going from there. And then there's a lot of um, wonderful forums on Facebook that are private, that are just for the narrator community, which is one of the most gracious communities I've ever been a part of. And people who are epics in the industry and to people like me when I first started who were super green, just eager to help and share their knowledge. And so I got a lot of advice from there. So it was kind of a mixture between coaching and then just meeting people online who do the same thing as I do. So do you recall your first book? Broken Skies by Teresa Kay. Loved it. It was a great book. 
Uh, yeah, I always like remember your firsts. <laughs> you do. You really do. You know, it's interesting. Um, like I said, I, I'm a huge um, reader myself. But when I'm looking for a book that I want to narrate, I kind of stick within things that I know that I'm going to enjoy. Um, I mean, I've done things that are outside of, let's say, I might not have necessarily picked up that book on my own just for pleasure. Um, but usually I stick to what I know I like because if I have a passion for what I'm reading, that passion should and hopefully will and does translate in my performance because it's not just as easy as just reading a book out loud because there's nuances to it i mean especially someone like ivy and phoenix who are such emotionally rich characters you can't just monotonely is that even a word um it is now it is now <laughs> i'm not a writer thanks um uh just read something so monotone when there are some deep gutting feelings that are happening, especially with that scene you had alluded to earlier in the podcast. So it's really important to find something that I can connect with, even if I can't, if I don't necessarily ex have the experience or can relate to the things that are happening to the character, um, I can still connect because I have a joy for what I'm reading. So let's talk a little bit about, as BL said before, uh, she was looking for auditions and you come across this uh, excerpt or whatever to to uh, read. And what a, what caught your attention about uh, Love Nouveau in the first place? You know, it's funny. Um, most of the most of us usually choose with our eyes first, whether it's food, a book cover, potential significant significant other. So as I was looking through titles that I might want to submit to, uh, the book cover arrested me. It's this beautiful artistic looking art uh, piece um, that has this uh, woman on the front who's got short cropped hair and it's a lot of pastels and it's, it's, it's has a lot of dynamics in the lines. And I too have an art background. Um, I went to school for game art and design. Um, so I was a game designer and I'm a gamer geek. But the art really captured me just from my artistic self. So that in itself made me want to actually look at it and read about it. And the more I read about it, the more I thought it was interesting. And then I went to go look up BL to find out more about her. So when I'm looking for a book that I'm interested in, in spending my time, not only in the audition, but if, if we decide that we want to work and collaborate together, I want to know as much as I can about the author as I can. So I looked on her Facebook or social media before I decided, you know what, I think this is going to be a book that I would be very much interested in. I read the sample, um, not only in the audition, but also on Amazon. And I just thought, oh, my God, I get Ivy. I haven't even read the book and I get her from what I'm seeing. And so I emailed her because it, it had been listed for a while. And anytime I see an audition that's listed for a while, I always email first. It's like, hey, are you still looking? Because sometimes they could be in the middle of negotiations or chats or, you know, you just don't know. Um, so then I emailed her and here we are. So you get the, the job. So after that happens, what is your process like for actually taking the book apart and, and then sort of reassembling it as a recording? Do you read through it all first? And what do you do sort of in your preparation to get things going yeah that's a perfect question yes read it first all the way through yes um I, there's no way that i would never not read the book completely before i even start to hit record there's so much that you need to know and understand that you may not see or hear um read excuse me until chapter 29 or or need to know what the subtext is or sometimes there's an accent you didn't even know happened until it's explained later in another chapter um, so it's really crucial uh, to read the entire book, at least for me. So usually what I like to do is I like to get as much information from the author as I can about the characters, about the book. I mean, I'm going to glean a ton from just reading it. But then there are those internal thoughts and, and ideas that the author knows best, maybe quirks, or maybe they have a, a cat. They, you know, a lot of um, authors will, quote, cast their characters in the sense like, oh, I, I, when I think of Ivy, I think of Rachel McAdams from The Notebook or not saying that she is, but I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out. So I like to know that kind of information. I mean, not that I'm going to mimic Reese Witherspoon or Rachel McAdams, but it gives me an idea of 
cadence or pace and this and that or their age and their quirks or whatever and have as much dialogue as I can with the author because after that first 15 minutes is approved, I have all the responsibility of being the director of this audiobook. So it, it, it's, it's a lot of pressure to make sure that I bring truth and honesty and honor to the words that the author has written because after that, it's all on me. It's my interpretation and bringing everything to life. So I'll read the book. I always ask for, oh, do you have a character sheet or any other information like that or a pronunciation guide if there's like weird words or did you make up a language or something? You never know. I mean, I've got a book I'm going to be doing later in the year where I have to speak Klingon. Who knew, right? The, uh, these things are important. And then I'll read the book. And as I'm reading the book, I make notes. Uh, and I use I annotate on my iPad, which I'm able to scribble all kinds of notes all over the place or highlight every time I find a new character as I learn more about it or about about them, I'll scribble down notes. You know, Ivy, she's troubled. She's got a horrible family. She's kind of gritty. She's snarky. She wants, she's got these walls up. She wants to let them down, but she's paranoid in that respect because she doesn't want to get hurt, et cetera, et cetera. So I write all that stuff down, what I emotionally feel or indicators that are literally taken from the book and just go on there for, for everything. And then if I have any questions or need clarification, then I'll shoot an email to the author and go, hey, I didn't quite understand this or what do you think about that? And then once all of that's sorted, then I start. And you told me uh, we first started chatting online about a month or so ago and you uh, mentioned the book. But you had also told me even more recent than that, that you actually had gotten sick and that sort of delayed things a little bit. Yeah. So how long did it take you in terms of recording hours to get the book done? The book running time is about seven hours and 37 minutes, but how long were you actually in the booth recording? Well, God bless BL because she was very understanding and gave me some leeway uh, when a bunch of stuff started to hit, you know, when life just happens. But usually for every hour of finished recording, of recorded audio, it takes about four to six actual real hours to do that from the prepping, from the reading, the, narr the uh, narrating, the editing, or, or et cetera. Since I was just coming off of being sick, it was a little bit difficult because I had a lingering cough, so it took a little bit longer, but I don't know, like maybe two and a half, three weeks to actually get it all recorded. My, you know, I'm in a booth. I have this beautiful booth, but it can get very hot and stuffy in here and you can't run AC. Uh, otherwise, the microphone's going to pick it up. So, yeah, I have to take a lot of breaks. And if it gets really hot. So, you know, I have to pace myself and, you know, it's never good to sit for too long. So luckily doing this full time, I have flexibility of my time. Like, OK, well, I'll do a couple hours here, take a break, then come back. So I'd say probably two and a half, maybe three weeks before I sent it off to the engineer. So after you send it off to the engineer, then what happens? Uh, they come back with uh, fixes for me to do. So it's beautiful. Like I'd only had to really, really, truly focus on the performance. I mean, there have been uh, a ton of books that I've done before where I'm also going to engineer, which is proofing it, editing it and mastering it. And a lot of times you can get in your head because you're self-editing as you go along and it can elongate the process. So when I sent it off to my fabulous engineer, um, they will listen to it, proof it, give me back uh, some information about where I made mistakes. Like if I missed a word or a sentence or said something incorrectly or whatever, then I'll go and do pickups and I'll fix those, send it back, which usually that's a one to two day turnaround. And then once I get those back, I uh, upload all of the files to ACX and then let BL know, hey, it's ready to listen and then pray that she likes it. <laughs> so let's bring the author back in for just a second so she can tell us how uh, she reacted when she finally got to hear the finished product. It, it's kind of surreal listening to your words be recited back to you. There's a lot of times when I just, I would hit pause and I would sit there with the goofy grin on my face. I'm like, I can't believe this is, this is it. Like, it's so awesome. And then there's other times where, you know, you might get to a steamy or questionable scene. You're like, oh my God, I wrote that. And you go like bright red. And I'm like, I hope my mom does not buy this and doesn't listen to it because she will be mortified. And Try narrating that and having <laughs> that same thought go through your mind. <laughs> 
So it's it's really just it's surreal and rewarding and humbling just to see how she's interpreted the entire piece all together. So um, I thought she did a phenomenal job. You know, a lot of times folks will have issues relinquishing creative control that she she got Ivy, she got Phoenix, she got Rachel and Genevieve and everybody else in just having it come together in harmony. It's really indescribable. Aw, <laughs> thanks. Checks in the mail, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's so satisfying to hear, because like what I was saying before is, you know, we always do our very best when we put forth an audiobook as a narrator, because, yes, the ebook, the the manuscript, the actual novel itself is 100% the baby and the, the love child of the author. But once it's an audiobook, it is now co-parented by the author and me and the narrator. So now I have just a stake in this as she does um, for it to be the best that it can be. And now there's going to be a ton of reviews where I'm the worst narrator ever. I'm like, oh, my God, she's the best. I mean, you can't help that. But my goal has always been, listen, I want to give this everything that I have, but I want it to be honest. I don't want it to be fake or false. And I really hope people like it. I hope the author likes it. And I just am grateful for the trust that authors give us to bring their story to life. And I thought you did a amazing job as well. It's the second audiobook I've listened to you narrate in the past month or so. And I've come to become a real big fan of your work. And I would be saying that if you weren't coming on my podcast to talk about it. <laughs> so um, it's, it's not just nice things to say because you're here. I really have been uh, enjoying listening to you. You have a very um, youthful voice, and that helps in a story like this where your uh, protagonist is a college graduate, and I've listened to you narrate high school kids. And like I told you in an email on another book that you read that like your voice totally fit the image that I had in my head for this character. And I think that happened again when I listened to Love Nouveau yesterday. It's like, yeah, I totally hear this voice coming out of this type of character, if that makes any kind of sense to you. It does, but it's also really edifying to hear that because that's that's the goal, right? That's what I want. And the biggest, actually one of the best compliments I could ever get would be, you know what? I enjoyed the performance so much I forgot you were reading it to me because there was no distraction. There's no jarringness. It just all made sense and clicked to where it's all about the story and not about the narrator. You know what I'm saying? So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And I got completely sucked into the book. And from then on, I was like, I cannot imagine pausing this for a second. Nobody better call me or anything <laughs> while I'm listening while I'm listening to this. BL, she said that she uh, noticed the cover art. Would you mind talking a little bit about the design of the cover? Absolutely. The one thing that I always strive for with my covers is to do something very different that will jump off the shelf because as much as we say we don't judge a book by our, by its cover, we do. Every single one of us does. And when I first met with my cover designer, um, we were chatting online. It's Najla Kumbar Design, so she's all the way across the pond. And I kind of I gave her the essence of the book. Um, she knew that there was a lot of art undertones in the in the storyline, and I was very loose. I was like, let's let's just go for something artistic and different. And she came up with a couple different concepts, and we really liked the idea of the, sort of the watercolor overlay of the cover itself. And so that's really once we found the right photo for to represent Ivy here. That's really just what kind of what kind of took off. And it doesn't matter what book signing I'm at. The cover is always a topic of discussion. And I'm really proud about that because I know it makes Naj happy. It makes me happy because it gets people to stop and consider a book that they may not have otherwise thought to look at. You know, that's something that rings true in audiobooks as well. And a lot of people don't even think about that because, you know, the same book cover is translated from the ebook or the hardcover manuscript book. Uh, to the audiobook, but it's a different setting uh, or size. And if you don't have a strong audiobook cover, 
people are just going to pass it by. It could be the best thing you've ever heard. It could be done by the most biggest celebrity or whatever. If it if the, the cover sucks, people are just going to keep passing and not even take the time to even read who narrated it, who wrote it or whatever. So, you know, as a personal, as a reader myself, I completely concur with that. And also it's something that I've seen translated in our industry as well. So sad but true, but it's it's true. Well, and it's interesting for me because as the listeners of this podcast know, I am nearly 100% totally blind. So I cannot judge a book by its cover because they all look black. <laughs> but I do look for different things, uh, you know, titles. Mm-hmm. Does a title grab my attention? And this one did, I have to admit, because I was like, what is nouveau? I, I don't even, it's not a term that I'm familiar with in my daily life. So the title definitely, I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. And then the the publisher's summary or the summary that you would see on a site like Audible or Goodreads uh, really got me intrigued as well because it doesn't really say a whole lot except, you know, it's something like it's hard. It was hard when he came into her life and even worse when he left or something, something like that. And it was short and simple, but it was like really intriguing. So that's something that I look at as someone who can't see. Yeah, I had a question for you that I was going to ask you earlier and then I forgot because God forbid I take notes. You have these two characters, Ivy and Phoenix. Those are pretty distinct names. Is there any sort of hidden or special meaning behind the the names and how they ended up uh, being affixed to these two characters? Well, Ivy, originally, so the sisters, when I first wrote it, were going to be Polly and Ivy with a little wink, nod, and smile to Christmas because I am obsessed with all things Christmas, shamelessly so. And then I was like, you know, that's so cliche, I can't do that. But I had grown so in love with the name Ivy um, that that it stuck. And we always joke because, you know, when I name characters, I name characters that names that I absolutely love and names that my husband would never let me name our children. So Ivy is one of those names. And then Phoenix, I like the idea of Phoenix being this, you know, rising from the ashes, rebirth, reborn. So that that kind of comes a little bit more into context in the second book, Love Abstract. But I really struggled with um, the male character's name for a really long time. And we had a good family friend was in town and she was telling us about, you know, a girlfriend that just had a baby and they named him Phoenix and they called him Nix. And as soon as she said that, I was like, stop right there what did you just say? And she repeated herself. And I was like, okay, I, I, I need to use that name. It's going in this book because as soon as I heard it, I knew it was perfect. And I like the idea of how they sound together and sort of the double meaning behind it. Andrea, I have a general narrator question for you because I read an article about this recently and I wanted to sort of get your take on it. You've done voiceover for uh, several different things, as you said, video games, animation, and so on. And have been doing it for a very long time. Did it take you any significant length of time to get used to hearing your own voice on tape? (laughs) You know, it's funny because everyone will say, oh God, I hate listening to myself. And I'm also one of those people, um, ironically. Uh, But it it did. Um, You never really sound the same as the way it sounds in your head when you actually hear yourself back. So it's a little jarring. You're like, oh wow, am I really? that higher of a pitch or have that gravelly tone or whatever the thing is. So that was a big thing to overcome since I knew that I really wanted to get into performing and acting and VO or any kind where I'm using my voice. And I used to be a professional singer. So the same thing goes with that. So I don't know. It's hard because I've been doing it for such a long time. But yeah, there is a transition period. But I'll tell you, though, when, you know, I'm listening back to to auditions or samples before I send it out or whatever, I still cringe a little bit like, oh, you know what, I can do that better because I don't like how that sounds. So that little self insecurity still creeps in every now and again. Well, and I think that's a, a pretty common trait amongst a lot of artists. They they see their work and they always find little things that they could uh, do better, and it's hard to sometimes let things go out into the world. But BL, do you have that as a writer? Do you look back and say, "Oh, maybe I could have used a different word here," or you know, 
express myself a little bit better, especially as you've gotten more practiced? Absolutely. Sometimes I go back and I read things that I wrote years ago and I'm like, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? Why did I do it like this? But at the same time, you know, it's a documented progression of my personal growth. So I try not to harp on it too much. Um, But even in the editing process, I think I drive my editor crazy because I'll noodle on things and change words and rewrite stuff. And then there just becomes a point where it's got to go to formatting and it's got to get proofread and everything else. So I just have to basically say, okay, enough with it, BL. Let's just get this out into the world. Yeah, I find that to be true with my audio, too, because if I keep listening to it over and over again and just constantly critiquing it, I'm going to over critique it and then it's going to probably suck. So a lot of times you just got to trust your instinct and maybe nudge a little bit here, but then you just got to have the faith and just say, listen, I've got all the tools that I have built, at least taking me up to this point. And this is what I'm going to put out there. And I'm really going to hope and pray that people like it, enjoy it and just keep growing and learning as we continue on. Every book I do, I learn more and I grow more and I get better and better, which I'm sure is same as with BL with her writing. So I think it's natural. And I loved how she said, just the natural progression of where she is at that time in her journey as a writer. And I feel the same as a narrator. So, Andrea, let me ask you this, and uh, hopefully you'll be willing to answer. This is uh, <laughs> a, a general narrator question for you. Perhaps it's uh, related to Love Nouveau, but maybe not. Uh, do you have any memorable bloopers or anything you remember having especially <laughs> difficult time getting through? Yes and yes. <laughs> Actually, that's very funny. When you're doing any kind of vocal performance, you might even get this as you're constantly speaking all the time in your podcasts. As you're constantly taking in breath all the time and then speaking, I t- maybe it's just me. I tend to belch a lot. <laughs> so I'll be in the middle of this like really powerful emotional scene and I'm like, but I just don't understand. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this show, this ruined because I just belched all over the place and I have to start over and then find that emotional spot again. Um, or your stomach, my stomach will gurgle or, or I'll wix merds where I'll mix the words up and because your eyes will end up playing tricks on you. So yeah, I mean... When I'm when when any of us are narrating as we're recording, there's never just a, a perfect take where you just you just get it all out in one shot. There are gonna be gonna be times where your tongue gets tied or your stomach gurgles or a doorbell rings or something happens or you belch and you can't help it. But then for me too, I get a lot of the emotional books where there's a lot of really deep emotional things happening to the characters. Not just that them with their character arc where they come to you know point A to point Z instead of where sometimes, you know, some characters are kind of a little bit superficial where they might only grow so far, but also have these like really deep, painful emotional experiences like the one that happens in this book that can be really taxing on me emotionally. And a lot of times that in itself could take me, you know, a scene like the one that, you know, the big bombshell that we've been alluding to (laughs) this whole time probably took me like an hour to get through because it was so hard to get through emotionally as I'm reading it I'll start just blubbering because I know what comes next so I have to stop myself and and re you know gain my composure and start again or sometimes I just have to take a moment and ugly cry because the emotions are so raw and that takes a while but you know what's beautiful about that and what I love the most and why I love getting those kind of books is it so powerful and so real that hopefully the final product will actually elicit that kind of reaction just as I got when I read it, just as I got as I performed it, that the listeners will get that when they hear it. Yeah, Yeah, and I can can attest to that. I actually have received several messages from readers that are like, holy crap, woman, that Andrea is fantastic. Like they're gushing over the performance, especially in those critical areas. And they're fighting the tears and they're feeling it right along with you because you did such an amazing job emoting, you know, everything that they're harboring inside. So well done. My hat's off to you, dear. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Your words helped a lot. (laughs) Okay, all of it, but you know. (laughs) Well, it really has been a great collaboration and Uh, I can attest to the fact that as I was looking earlier today, it had all five-star reviews on Audible at the 
uh, time that I had last looked. So the people that have listened have uh, really enjoyed it and have really given it some positive feedback. And I think one of the reviews said, I, I read it when it came out and I was so excited when an audible version came out and now I've listened to it and I'm blown away, things like that. So it's uh, a testament to the both of you. And for the record, Andrea, I will confirm that yes, indeed, if such things existed, which they do not, <laughs> but if they did, the the outtakes of my mistakes or errors or problems on this podcast would be <laughs> voluminous. And fortunately, I tend to scrub them and just start over and they hit the ether never to uh, emerge. But if I had kept them, there would be a number of them. I seem to only get a frog in my throat when I'm recording. Right? Yeah, me too. <laughs> so that is crazy. Well, before we get out of here for the day, and I again want to thank you both uh, for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. I think uh, first I'll give you a chance if we've missed anything that you think is noteworthy. Uh, BL, we'll start with you. Is there anything else that you want the listeners of this podcast to know about uh, this book coming together as an audio book? You know, it's it was just a true collaboration, and I appreciate Andrea more than she can ever begin to comprehend because she really she did the words justice and you know, as proud as I am about the book, I'm so proud of her performance too. And I really hope everybody, you know, even if you don't read romance, gives this book a chance because I think it's worth listening to. And there's some really good lessons that come out of it. And Andrea, yeah. do you have anything? Well, besides agreeing and in, in, in standing in solidarity, so solidarity with what BL said, you know, I think if you can give your mind and your imagination a chance to just allow a story to move you and take you where it, wherever it is that it needs to take you. You don't know if a book that you're going to read, which you think is for entertainment, might actually hit a chord with you and teach you something or, or free you of something. I know this book in a way did that for me in some personal ways, which is always exciting. And I think this book is not just a romance, a college romance or something like that, but it's very deep and meaningful and purposeful. And is it actually kind of a commentary on certain things, which I think are important. So for me as well, yeah, it's not just a romance. It's so much more. I don't know exactly when yet. I have to look at my schedule, but I am excited to be narrating Love Abstract. And I'm happy to hear that because I cannot wait to find out what happens in the second half. There's a uh, tease of things in the epilogue. The epilogue I found a little bit maddening because I wanted to know what happened right now. And <laughs> confined to listening to the book, I have to wait, but I'm happy to hear that it is coming. Well, you guys both answered my next question pretty well. I was going to say, if someone is on the fence about whether or not they should listen to uh, Love Nouveau, what would you say to them? And I think you both said it. So before we wrap it up, I was telepathically sent a question from producer Ken and he would like uh, you guys to talk a little bit both from a uh, author and narrator perspective and we'll start with you BL on working with ACX and uh, that would be good for maybe the listeners to this podcast who aren't tied to the industry and maybe don't have any idea of what ACX is you mentioned using them to uh, get your audiobook out there in the first place. But what what is it like to work with ACX from uh, the standpoint of an author? Yeah, so my experience so far and with the two audiobooks that I've done with ACX, it's been really positive. It's For me, it was very user-friendly. Um, and there's if you go in the first time, it's a little overwhelming. But once you kind of take a step back and really look at the step by step process and the options that they offer for both authors and the talent, it really it's it's very well defined and, and simplified, which I appreciated. Um, I don't do well with a lot of minutia, a lot of random things. But my biggest my biggest piece of advice for anybody considering using ACX from the author standpoint is just to be patient and wait for the right talent. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, I got a lot of um, auditions that just, 
they weren't that good. And I know I understand there's a, you know, it's the way people interpret it. Maybe it's their equipment. Maybe they're new and they're still trying to get their feet wet. But really just just hold out and wait for the right opportunity because it will come along. It may not happen when you first list. Like in my case with Love Nouveau, it may take, you know, six, seven weeks before you find the magic voice. And if you have to delist it and list it again later, that's fine too. Because, you know, great talent is hard to find, I think. And you want to make sure that whoever takes the book under their wing does a good job. And like I said earlier, we'll do something that will make you proud. And Andrea, from the narrator's perspective, what are your thoughts on ACX? Yeah, again, ACX stands for Audiobook Exchange, which is a forum for self-published authors or smaller publishers to come in and put their work up for auditions and, you know, to actually have a, an immediate place to find talent. And for us, it's fantastic where we can also search for the work um, that is not as readily available with the big, big, big publishers. So it's, it's just been an incredible explosion of opportunity that ACX provides, which is for both of us, for both authors and narrators. For me, I agree. It is very intuitive. Uh, you know, there is a lot of reading in a, in a little bit way. It was a little overwhelming too, but ACX has done such a good job of giving as much information for research and understanding and, and tutorials and videos. I mean, you couldn't have a more encyclopedic approach to learning their system if you take the time to read it. And then when I, like I said earlier, for me, when I am looking and deciding on what kind of a book I want to audition for, which if I audition for it, that means that if I am offered it, then I am going to do this book. Because I don't just audition randomly and they go, eh, no, I don't want to do it. Because that's just not fair to you or the author who heard your audition is super excited about you. And then you're like, no, forget it. I changed my mind. Unless something happens scheduling wise. So I do. I, I, I research the book. I look at the rankings and the ratings on Amazon um, just to see how well it's doing. I look at the reviews to see what people loved about it, what people didn't like. And that's really important for me as a narrator, because a lot of times and sadly, I've had this happen to me. The audition script is so well written and just it's it's perfect. There's no errors. There's no editing issues. And then when you get the job as you're reading the book, you're like, holy moly, I guess they didn't hire an editor for the whole rest of the book. And then you have to send that back. And it can be a little bit frustrating. So you learn a lot about some of the good and the bad in the reviews from the ebook, um, which I think is very helpful. So it's important for us to be, and then I learn as much as I can about the author. Patience is a really good way to put it. You know, with being an, a, a, an actor or a narrator, you have to deal with rejection, have a really thick skin, realize once you audition, you let it go and you forget it existed because you don't want to harp on, man, I did 10 auditions last week and I didn't get one, you know, and it can make you sad or whatever. You just, that's just, it's a hustle. That's the way it is. But you also want to take the time to spend and, and research as much as you can because you're committing yourself not only to the work that you're going to do, your name is going to be on it and it's going to be with you this for at least seven years, which is the contract that we the initial contract we have with Audible. So it's important, just like BL said, to wait for talent. It's important to also take your time to find a good match as best as you can when looking for books you want to possibly do. And when you do find it, you get uh, a result like Love Nouveau, which is absolutely tremendous. I highly recommend it to anybody that's listening to this podcast right now. Um, we're going to get out of here in just a moment. We'll let you get your plugs in for whatever you need to do. But before we do that, Andrea, I did have one more question for you. You went to a pack this year. Did you uh, have any memorable uh, stories come out of that that you would be willing to share with us? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It was so exciting. So what he's talking about is um, APAC, which is the Audio Publishers Association Conference that was in New York earlier this year, which is, you know, our Comic-Con, if you will, for uh, publishing for audiobooks and, and publishers to come, uh, uh, audiobook narrators and publishers to come together and meet. It was very exciting. And it was my first one. And it was a little nerve wracking because, you know, this is a big schmooze event where you get FaceTime with a lot of the big publishers and and which is always a wonderful place to 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 have a goal is to someday I would love to work with Penguin House or Simon and Schulster or whomever. And you actually get an opportunity to go to the panels and learn 
from these wonderful uh, coaches or people who have been in the industry for a super long time as narrators and speak to casting. But you know, one of the coolest things that I that I really take away that really just made me all warm and fuzzy inside, which I don't know if a lot of people are gonna understand this or relate, was seeing all my friends. So you may not know this, but narrators are in a box for most of our day. Whether your audio booth is in a closet, which is where my very first one was, uh, or in a professional one like I have now, and we're alone. It's just us and the microphone and the, the words. And it can get very lonely. So the Facebook forums that I was telling you about earlier, where I'm constantly speaking to a ton of other narrators every single day, I know these people for the last three years. I feel like it, it was like a, a family reunion. And it was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, hug, hug, hug. It was awesome. You know, as much as I absolutely learned so much more about my craft and about the industry and got some really amazing contacts and thankfully some jobs from it, my my the thing I, I hold on to the most was kind of solidifying my friendships in a physical form in the sense of meeting them finally face to face and getting to hug them and go, ha, ah, so nice to meet you. I just I think you're right. I think. I read a lot of narrator blogs and things like that, and uh, people talk about the family and the fraternity and things like that. And you mentioned how supportive a group it is earlier, and I'm in a couple of different Facebook groups that aren't just for uh, narrators or for uh, anyone really that are fans of audiobooks, audiobook addicts, and audiobook lovers. And uh, you know, the narrators that I've chatted with in those groups are all really super nice and really super helpful. And my interview list grew from like a few names to so long, I don't even know where it ends. And uh, it's just a tremendous community that very supportive of each other's work. And I think that really uh, benefits the end user in the in the long run when it works out that way. I agree. I'm in those groups too. And it's nice to be able to chat, not just with your peers, but with other authors or just bibliophiles or audiophiles, you know, and, and it's, it's just a fantastic culture and community all the way around. So yeah, I agree with you. And so I think that's going to do it. But before we get out of here, BL, I'll start with you. Um, why don't you, you could take as long as you want and plug whatever you want, but get your plugs out there for where people can find you online and what other projects you might have coming up and all that fun stuff. Well, yeah. So I've got two awesome and exciting projects on the docket right now. Um, the first is actually an anthology called Mom Fail. So if you're looking for it, you're looking for hashtag Mom Fail. And it is 24 short stories. Um, it's pretty much all based in in reality that some of us have twisted it to fiction to protect the innocent. Um, but it's a hilarious compilation of stories from motherhood and just the ridiculousness that kids put us through. It's It's been a lot of fun to write, even more fun to promote, and it's actually going to be releasing on July 25th, so shortly after this podcast will hopefully air. And then my second project that I'm working on is my fourth full-length novel, Birthquake, and that releases on September 21st this year. And it's using some of the characters from my mom fail short story. And it's a rom-com about a girl who accidentally gets knocked up and just basically exploits every single ridiculous paranoia that every mom to be has ever had. It was a lot of fun to write again, a lot of truth based on my personal experiences um, from having kids, but it was a blast. And where can they find you online and, yeah. Social media and all that fun stuff. Sure thing. So my website is www.authorblberry.com and that's B L B E R R Y, just like the fruit. And my Instagram handle is at BLBerry Rights. My Twitter handle is the same at BLBerry Rights. And you can also find me on Facebook. Sounds great. And Andrea, where can people find you and what do you have that you can talk about? <laughs> right. Um, but it's a little bit different from a narrator's point of view. A lot of the amazing books I have on my queue I can't talk about just yet because there's an embargo, um, but I'm super excited about them. I, I do have um, Digital Horizon, which is about to release soon, which is book three of the Geek Girl Mysteries, which I did the book two for In Too Deep by Sherry Ficklin. Super excited about that coming out. And then Under the Bottle Bridge by Jessica Lawson's coming out soon. 
Uh, and then I'm really excited about this lit RPG book that I'm going to be starting next month called Conquest by Alaric Eros. Uh, lit RPG is a, a gamer kind of a, a themed fantasy book, sci-fi book, um, excuse me, fantasy book. And uh, I, like I said, I used to be a game designer and I have a, I'm a huge gamer geek. So I'm super excited to get into that world and do those kind of books. One of the things for me has been really an honor for is, you know, over the last seven months, my narration of Little Women has been doing incredibly well and was a bestseller. So there's some potential things on the horizon in that respect that I can't go into, but I'm really excited about that. And then really, other than that, I can be found on Facebook as well. My website is www.andreams.com, A-N-D-R-E-A. E as in Edward, double M as in Mary, E as in Edward, S as in Sam. My Twitter is at A-M's. My Instagram is at A-M's Narrator. And I think that's it. Yeah, I'd love, love you to come by and say hi. <laughs> well, I want to encourage everyone to do that and also to check out Love Nouveau. If you listen to it, I think you're going to be very excited to hear Love Abstract when that comes out. And we're going to throw right now to a promo so you can get a free trial of audible.com using uh, a link provided by this podcast. And then after that, I will be back for more fun and excitement on the other side of the break, all by my lonesome. I will, again want to thank you guys both for doing the show today. I think this is an interview that people are going to really enjoy. With that, we will throw to uh, Ken as he tells us how to get a free trial of audible.com just by listening to this podcast. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. And we're back, and I hope you enjoyed hearing that interview with B.L. Berry and Andrea Ems. I think it's a good look at what it takes to get an audiobook made when you're not being backed by a major publisher like Random House or HarperCollins or Simon & Schuster or Hachette Audio or, you know, recorded books. How do you get an audiobook made? I think that's an interesting thing for some of our listeners. Some of our listeners who are industry types, that's not exactly uh, newsworthy to them. But for those of you who just listen to uh, the show and just listen to audiobooks, and that's all your involvement extends to in the industry, I think it was a good look for you at what it takes to get an audiobook made on the independent level. And I have to say that my favorite part of the whole thing was listening to them talk back and forth to each other. I joked with them at one point that I said, you know, you guys really don't need me because they were uh, answering my questions just in the flow of normal conversation before I even had a chance to ask them. And so I said, you know, I could just leave and you guys could talk to yourself. And it's because they had such good interaction going back and forth and that interaction is the product of their collaboration on the book that's what allowed them to uh, go back and forth like that with each other and allowed me to sort of lay out for a few moments and so that's why i think this interview was so much fun it was two people that were happy to be here and tell us about their project and working with one another and have a genuine appreciation for the work of the other. I think that matters a lot, and I think that's why the interview was so much fun for me to do, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. And you can send any comments you may have about the interview to feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you thought. Are you going to check out the book? And if you do, let us know what you think of Love Nouveau. If you don't want to email us, you can hit us up on Twitter at Talking Audio. Let us know. Hey, I really enjoyed this interview with Andrea 
NPL. That was a lot of fun. You can get to me at Audiobook KC on Twitter, all one word, Audiobook C A S E Y. You let me know uh, any comments you might have, any things that you noticed. And like I said, we would love to hear from you if you plan to listen to the book. Moving on to the What Caught My Ear segment this week. Of course, in fiction, What Caught My Ear was Love Nouveau, which you can find on audible.com and which you heard an excerpt of earlier in this podcast. But there is a nonfiction title that caught my ear this week, and it is a little bit out there in terms of subject matter. When I came across this book, I sent a tweet to a friend of mine who uh, runs the website whenitwascool.com, and he has a radio show, podcast, whatever you want to call it, that is in the vein of Coast to Coast with Art Bell from back in the day, if you uh, remember Art Bell from his work on Coast to Coast AM, which is still on the air with George Norrie as host. He hosts a podcast called Dragon King Dark, and they cover a lot of those topics as well. But uh, Carl also does a lot in science and technology and uh, just music and different things of that nature. You never really know what you're going to get each week. But when I saw this book, I tweeted him and I said, this sounds like a topic for a episode of Dragon King Dark. It just sounds like it's right up his alley. So like I said, this is not a mainstream topic. And before I tell you the book, I need to, again, remind you that this is something that caught my ear. It's not something that I've listened to yet because the book just came out on July 18th, but it's something that is going to be in my library by the time you hear this episode. So this is not an endorsement of the quality of the book, and it's also my opinion. Nobody else has any say over what I pick each week for the segment. Ken doesn't know until I tell him. We don't get any pressure from any author, narrator, publisher, or whatever to feature their work. Uh, This is just me picking stuff that interests me. And I try to vary it up and pick some interesting out there topics. Our nonfiction, what caught my ear title for this week is Hitler's Monsters, A Supernatural History of the Third Reich. And this is written by Eric Cullender. And it is narrated by the incomparable Grover Gardner for Blackstone Audio. It was released on July 18th, 2017, and has a running time of 18 hours and 17 minutes. And this book is about what it sounds like it would be about. It's about the Nazis and their fascination with the occult and paganism and witchcraft and the lost continent of Atlantis. There's no shortage of different uh, areas in which they uh, shaped their philosophies and viewpoint of politics. And it was interesting, as the publisher's summary notes, that uh, on the one hand, they're suppressing these types of uh, beliefs in their citizenry. But on the other hand, they're sort of using it as a as a guidepost. And this is not something that I learned all that much about in my own high school German class. Let me assure you of that. So uh, we're going to do, as we do every week, play an excerpt of Hitler's Monsters, A Supernatural History of the Third Reich by Eric Cullender, narrated by Grover Gardner. And this, again, comes to you from Blackstone Audio. And after we play this excerpt, I will be back to wrap up the show for this week. Supernatural History of the Third Reich by Eric Kurlander. This book is read by Grover Gardner. Introduction 
The success of National Socialism, the unique appearance of the Führer, has no precedent in German history. The consequence of these historic and unprecedented political occurrences is that many Germans, due to their proclivity for the romantic and the mystical, indeed the occult, came to understand the success of National Socialism in this fashion. Alfred Rosenberg, 1941 Horror always lurks at the bottom of the magical world, and everything holy is always mixed with horror. From a page underscored by Hitler and Ernst Schertel's occult work, Magic, History, Theory, and Practice, 1923. Outside a purely secular frame of reference, Nazism is felt to be the embodiment of evil in a modern 20th century regime, a monstrous pagan relapse in the Christian community of Europe. Nicholas Goodrick Clark Early in the blockbuster movie Captain America, The First Avenger, 2011, a Nazi officer enters a small Norwegian town in search of an ancient relic, the Tesseract, which promises its owner infinite power. We soon find out that the officer, Johannes Schmidt, has imbibed the prototype of a super-soldier serum developed by a fringe scientist named Abraham Erskine. Intended to give Schmidt superhuman strength and agility, the serum instead causes a monstrous transformation, driving the Nazi officer mad and turning his head into a ghastly red skull. Erskine escapes to America, where he perfects his serum, transfiguring the prototypical 98-pound weakling Steve Rogers into our eponymous hero. Captain America has little time to hone his combat skills before confronting the Red Skull and the insidious occult society known as Hydra, which, it turns out, pulls the strings behind Hitler and the Third Reich. Captain America contains all the elements of Nazi supernaturalism in the popular mind, the connection to occult forces, mad scientists, fantastical weapons, a superhuman master race, a preoccupation with pagan religions, and magical relics supposed to grant the Nazis unlimited power. From comic books produced already during the Second World War era to 21st century video games like Castle Wolfenstein, from classic science fiction and adventure films such as Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Boys from Brazil, to contemporary horror movies like Dead Snow or superhero franchises such as Captain America, popular culture is awash with images of the Nazi supernatural. Of course, few of these comic books, films, or video games are based on reliable primary evidence. Most popular representations of Nazism, even in documentary form, also fail to investigate deeper connections between supernatural thinking and policies and practices in the Third Reich. Rather, the most popular television documentaries generally alternate between making exaggerated claims based on limited evidence and exposing revelations regarding the hidden history of obscure intellectuals or projects whose influence in the Third Reich is dubious at best a method that comes perilously close to the practice of occultism. The irony is that the evidence indicating an important link between Nazism and the supernatural has never been greater. In the mid-1920s, Hitler almost certainly read Ernst Schertel's parapsychological tome, Magic, History, Theory, Practice, underlining sentences such as Satan is the fertilizing, destroying, constructing warrior, and he who does not carry demonic seeds within him will never give birth to a new world. A few years later, Josef Goebbels hired the famous Weimar horror writer Hans Heinz Evers to fulfill important propaganda texts. That was 
Hitler's Monsters, A Supernatural History of the Third Reich, written by Eric Colander, narrated by Grover Gardner from Blackstone Audio. Look for that where audiobooks are sold. That is what caught my ear this week. Maybe it didn't catch your ear, although if it did, please let me know. It's about time to wrap up the show for this week. I again want you to visit our website at TalkingAudiobooks.com or check us out on Facebook. Our Facebook page is Facebook.com slash Talking Audiobooks. And as I said to start this show, if you hit the like button on that page, you are entered to win four promo codes from Audible.com. The deadline for entry is at the end of the day Pacific time on July the 31st, and we will announce the winner shortly thereafter. Uh, If you don't have Facebook or if you want to enter via another mean, then we have a number that you can send a text to. That number is 313131, and you text the word EZENTER. That's E-Z-E-N-T-E-R, no spaces or anything like that. E-Z-E-N-T-E-R, EZENTER and you will be entered into the Talking Audiobooks uh, contest. You'll get a confirmation text letting you know that you are in. So I welcome all of you to go ahead and enter the contest. Uh, You can also find us on Twitter at Talking Audio. You can find me on Facebook, Goodreads, and Twitter at Audiobook Casey. That's Audiobook C-A-S-E-Y. And that is going to wrap it up for this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed our wonderful interview with Andrea Enns and B.L. Berry. Be sure to say hello to them on social media as well. And we'll be back next week with more. But until then, I want to do what I do to encourage you at the end of each show, and that is to just... Keep listening. Talking Audiobooks is a trademark of KenJoy Media, produced by KenJoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by KenJoy, theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through EpidemicMusic.com. Visit our website at TalkingAudiobooks.com, follow us on Twitter at TalkingAudio, Follow us on Facebook at Talking Audio Books and subscribe to the Talking Audio Books YouTube channel. Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors like Audible.com help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content. They don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you. And therefore, the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.